something like that of our current rocket program. The design of the rocket must be done by students and it is here at UND. Scientific payload must be an actual scientific payload. Ours is actually a guide counter, which I'll be discussing in a little while. And testing of the rocket and other things such as um, proper calibration of your scientific equipment, proper fabrication, and then funding. Funding as a group, we found that funding is one of the most difficult things to find uh, as an organization. We had a budget of approximately $7,800. Thankfully, the ERC, or the Energy and Environmental Research Center here at the University of North Dakota, was gracious enough to help with our donations, and also the North Dakota Space Grant Consortium. We've also recently attained funding from the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost. And with them, we've almost completely reached our budget of fabrication of the rocket, outreach programs, in which I'll be talking in just a little bit, uh, the traveling of the team down to Huntsville, Alabama, where the competition takes place, and the construction of a scale test launch, which we must have. So part of our outreach, including this lecture here, we have plans for Engineering Week, Physics Day again in, in March when we'll be doing a small rocket launch, some school visits. This picture here is of a high school team out of Midway, North Dakota. They are planning on joining the TARC, which is Team America Rocketry Challenge for high schoolers. So right now we're discussing with them uh, Stripe here. Here's our uh, camera can, our cluster that will be built soon. Just this last Saturday, we had a Girl Scouts event. We went and give them, gave them a small presentation regarding rocketry and, and how it's happening in history and such like that. And then we did an, ex an experiment with film canisters where with water and Alka-Seltzer put together, the film canister shoots up uh, from under pressure up to about, I'd say, 20 to 30 feet with a lot of fun. So again, then we'll also be looking in uh, April and May for uh, another Boy Scout event. Some of our advisors are um, NAR members of the National Black Tree Association. We've been discussing with them safety regulations that we must adhere by. Safety is uh, stressed extreme, like, at an extreme amount for this competition. Procedures, uh, MSDS sheets, material, material safety data sheets, and the such. So with their assistance, uh, we are hoping to abide by and have no penalties at this competition. One of the things we've been focusing on a lot with our rocket, as with any rocket, is the fin design. The fins are crucial as to attaining a high altitude, low drag, and all that such. Here's a drawing done by uh, one of our students in uh, one of the engineering programs. This is our current fin design for our scale rocket here. This was our scale test launch that we did. Has a coefficient of about 0.07, where um, it is said in our simulation program that we're using called Roxin, where you can build rockets and such, that under 8% coefficient is, accept is acceptable. For, so for our scale launch, we're looking at an accept we had an acceptable, uh, acceptable, yeah, drag yeah, drag coefficient. <laughs> So now to introduce our competition rocket. Our competition rocket, this being the scale one, is going to be about 8 feet in length, or 93 inches. This drawing here, done in solid works by um, our team member Kyle Anderson. The nose cone to the payload bay, our payload bay housing our Geiger counter and digital recorder, uh, recording device, will be separated by a lengthy tube here in the center, where the separation for drogue will occur between the payload and the altimeter bay here. So this added space will help assist in uh, the safety of our payload. Then at altitude of approximately 300 feet under descent, the main parachute will be deployed between the fin cam and the altimeter bay right here. For easy access to our altimeters on site at the competition will be taking place in a field and our uh, guide counter, we're going to be using a sled design. This sled, uh, which rides on two uh, per uh, parallel metal bars inside the rocket, allows for us to access the altimeters very quickly on site so that if we have to do any reprogramming of an alt altimeter due to rules or regulations there at the field, we can do such in a quick manner. Also, when we, you know, you get back to your lab and you want to access your materials, you want to be able to have easy access to your scientific payload. So the payload, the guide counter, will also sit on such a sled design too. 
So here is a rough workout of our payload bay. It will, if the, the white part here being the body of the tube, we will have um, uh, the batteries that are required, the Geiger counter, and then an altimeter to assist in the altitude uh, requirements for our payload. So what is our payload then? Our payload is going to be studying cosmic ray activities as a function of altitude. Now, cosmic ray occurs when such things like the sun expelling high velocity particles or high energy particles such as protons, which make up 90% of all cosmic ray activity, or helium atoms, which are also referred to as alpha particles, or other types of um, high energy particles, um, neutrons, but it's far less likely. The, what happens is, is these high energy particles streaming in from uh, the outer space collide with our atmosphere, so uh, the nitrogen, oxygen, all those such gases, when it uh, ionizes such gas, uh, radiation is released, and, and internally when cosmic, uh, radiate, cosmic rays bombard your body, it's very unhealthy. So for about uh, a period of lifetime, 13% of all the radiation you receive is caused to cosmic radiation. Now that's at, you know, at average altitude here that we live in. The higher the altitude, the less of an atmosphere to protect you shield-wise, even the magnetic field. So for example, an uh, astronaut doing a spacewalk, an eight-hour spacewalk, receives the same amount of radiation due to cosmic radiation, solar radiation, same thing. Uh, the same that we receive here in six months. So space travel wise, this is a big concern. How to shield your astronauts during long trips to such planets like Mars or, or thereon, the satellites, the um, uh, telescopes, the, the James Webb telescope having that, that solar shield to help assist in blocking such events like that. One thing about cosmic rays is that it's disputable at the moment, but still a very interesting science field, is that cosmic rays could actually affect climate here on Earth. And also, lightning could also be caused. So these are two very interesting science fields that are occurring at this time. Here's a picture of our Geiger counter. Our Geiger counter came unassembled. Our team members assembled it uh, um, together. This is the Geiger, uh, Geiger Geiger Muir tube, as it's called, right here. What it is is the tube is considered um, consists of a cathode and, a, and an atom. So the outer shell is a cathode. Inside is a halogen-like gas on the inside, and on the very inside is an anode tube. On the very end is a micro window. So when these high energy particles enter through the micro window, they ionize the gas, the halogen gas on the inside, and these uh, the gas releases an electron, which gets attracted to the anode and completes a uh, circuit. So with a digital output connected to our digital recorder, we will be uh, studying the effects of, well, the relationship of altitude to uh, amount of radiation encountered. So our, altim our altimeter that we will be uh, coupling this with to find altitude is actually the GWIS uh, LCX um, altimeter. On board has a barometric pressure reader. It also has an accelerometer for sensing um, other uh, events such as for you know apogee and stuff like that, burnout and such for analysis. So here's a couple photos. Photo here, we are constructing the fin can section of our scale rocket. We're using a high strength power by West Systems, uh, uh, epoxy by West Systems. It's uh, a very dangerous. Uh, chemical and then the filler we're using is like very tiny, tiny dust glass beads. So we have to use um, uh, respirators to aid in um, inhalation of such particles and gloves because the, this epoxy.